I'd like to start the discussion on how to design a better schoolhouse. Much of rethinking education has to do with what technology, the changes that technology is doing to the way education is delivered. And so as these changes in delivery method are happening, the kind of spaces that we need to do to assist to facilitate those new methods needs to, need to be rethought. Let's start with information. The teacher now doesn't need to be the source of information. We can get information from a variety of sources on the internet mostly. So getting the information isn't the issue. The challenge is critical thinking, what to do with that information once we have it. Critical thinking is one of the skills identified as 21st century skill in the book uh, by Bernie, Bernie Trilling and Charles Fadham. Oh, I got that wrong. Charles Fadham and Bernie Trilling, 21st century skills. They identify critical thinking, collaboration, communication, cultural awareness. A lot of these begin with C. I heard one of the teachers say that, well, those are the seven C's and the three R's. That's kind of the pirate pack. Critical thinking is a skill, and those collaboration, communication, so forth are skills. Skills are learned. Did I get that right? Skills are learned by doing. Now you can get a lecture, you can watch a video, you can have coaching. There are a variety of ways to get information about these skills. It's like a golf swing. If you watch the videos and get a lecture and so on, you'll learn a lot of information. But ultimately, you've got to do the swing and you've got to adjust accordingly. And even Tiger has a coach. These skills, like collaboration, like communication, start with people speaking to one another. Two people speaking together, four, six, uh, groups of 10, 12, doing things in different ways. So the spaces that these kinds of activity need, need to allow for groupings of two, six, larger groups. It needs to be flexible so that you can change the configuration depending on where the conversation or the collaboration goes. Then another pillar or another movement in designing schools recognizes that no two people learn the same. Uh, research done by Rita, Dr. Rita Dunn and Dr. Kenneth Dunn have identified 20 different elements that affect the way people learn. For example, some people are auditory learners, and I know the, the, the teachers know all this. I just learned it, but it's important to advancing how the environment is going to be designed. Some people are auditory learners, and apparently less than 25% of us actually remember anything after a lecture or remember very little of it. Some of us, are like me, are uh, visual learners. We need a picture of it, or we need a picture of the phone number so we remember the phone number. Uh, others need to move around and so forth. They've identified other factors, environmental factors. Some people like to have bright light. Some people are better in soft light. Uh, some people like it warm. Some people like it definitely cold. Some people can study and work hard at a hard table and chair. Some people like to sit in a soft, comfortable furniture with softer light. Some like background music, some don't. They've also identified sociological factors, emotional factors, the way we process information. Do we, do we gather information globally, see the whole picture, or analytically? Do we like to get something figured out in order to figure out uh, what the big picture might be? So spaces for these different uh, learning styles need to be differentiated. So we need to have spaces where people can maybe work by themselves, or people can work in groups. We need spaces where it might be quiet with soft furniture and soft lighting. We might have spaces that are a little more noise tolerant. 
Uh, we have spaces where people can be active and more, a little more sedate. And most of all, these spaces need to be flexible so that as the activity changes, you can move the furniture around. You've got to have casters on the furniture. You've got to move the walls around uh, in order to make it flexible, in order to re react to all of the requirements of the individual learners would need. There is a, a movement to uh, create smaller schools. Research has shown that uh, smaller schools there provide greater opportunities for leadership roles for the, for the students. And also academic achievement, especially in math and verbal skills, apparently is better in a smaller school. So the movement to create a smaller school is really to create a school, a smaller school within a school. Uh, University Hill, this is the plan of University Hill, and we've created one, two, three, four learning communities here on the second floor, and there are three on the main floor for a total of seven. Centennial in Coquitlam has one, two, three, four learning communities on each floor for a total of eight. And these spaces have movable walls, movable glass walls. And this one starts off as a traditional kind of uh, lecture style. It can transform, take the walls apart, different kinds of tables, uh, different kinds of uh, environments to, to accommodate uh, different things that are going on. And you need to have presentation walls in a variety of spaces. We had a charrette with uh, some of the students from the, this school, and there were, there were 32 that particular day. And we were talking about, well, we used the word modalities, that seemed to be a good word, about whether they like to learn by themselves, whether they like to learn in groups, whether they like to give a presentation uh, to, the public, to, to each other, and so forth. And so out of the 32, only one stuck his hand up that he liked to work by himself. And the ones that would do a presentation, they said stick their hands up, 16. It astonished me, but that is the reality now. The kids are really totally comfortable with standing in front of their peers and presenting material, either in video form or lecture or a drama or a skit or acting it out. Here's another example that has movable wall, and these are garage doors. Garage doors are kind of trendy right now. You can flick a switch, and, and uh, two minutes later, you've got a bigger space. This allows a variety of different combinations, just by depending the, on which wall you take apart. So you can see you can get very large spaces, and you can have still some traditional uh, spaces that don't don't adjust. These smaller groupings of students uh, do reduce isolation and alienation. Uh, certainly if you're one of 1,200 or one of 1,500 or 2,000, you certainly are way more anonymous than if you're one of a smaller group. And if you Google the magic of 150, you'll see that a number of successful organizations have arrived at 150 as their optimum number. And it seems that that number is the number that we can know everybody. And it's large enough that there's enough diversity and enough resources that membership in that community is worthwhile. And yet it's not too many where you're, where you're isolated and alienated. Um, like all uh, true communities, the being in, anchored in space and time gives you the opportunity to start communication. And communication then helps build relationships. And communication and relationships facilitates learning. These uh, learning spaces here, this is U Hill. Before they moved in, they just moved in in January, uh, so the furniture isn't really all there. You see the classrooms here are around this uh, uh, project area. These are all overhead doors, sliding glass doors. These doors all open up. Uh, so there's a, a fair amount of uh, flexibility, spontaneity, and breakout space. 
uh, into this project area. In addition to the project area, we have a teacher preparation area, a teacher sometimes called a professional area. And these areas, and here, here's a picture of the way they look at U Hill. Here's one on the side of a learning community. Here's another one out uh, on the side of another learning community. And these provide the opportunity for teachers to collaborate. Um, and it provides an opportunity to, for different subjects, for cross-discipline kind of instruction, to work it out together because you're in the same space. It allows also, because of the glass and transparency, passive supervision and management of what's going on in the rest of the building. There's a subtle power shift implied here as well. Uh, some of the principles of some of the schools we've been designing have said we want to have more teachers in these professional spaces than there are classrooms so that nobody owns the classroom. Uh, so the teacher space is here, their preparation area, their books and so on is here. It's not in the classroom. There's a subtle shift so that the, the classroom is not teacher-centered. It becomes more learner-focused. And so this subtle transformation of power is not, doesn't go down well that well, and, and some, you know, some of the teachers are not particularly happy with that. You know, and I'm not down on teachers. Being a teacher right now is extremely difficult, I think. I mean, they have teachers, well, many of you in the room here are teachers. Teachers are, have the curse of living in interesting times. They've got uh, the ministry uh, curriculum. They've got parent expectations. They've got parent, uh, their principal's expectations. They have student expectations. I've had students tell me, I'm not interested in this 21st century stuff. I need a 95 point average because I'm going to Harvard. And they're interested and focused in SAT scores and so forth. So being a teacher, I think, is a very challenging kind of situation right now. The examples I've showed you could be considered to be devolution of the classroom. It's starting with the classroom, taking the walls apart, moving it around to create other kinds of spaces. We still design many schools like this, classrooms on a corridor. This is easy to do. Uh, there is another way to, there is another approach. Oh, sorry, well, here, here there, we, we toured 10 of these in Salt Lake City, and they're all variations of classrooms on a project space. Here we got a lab as part of the learning community. Uh, this one here, the teacher preparation area is at the end, the labs are on the side. Uh, they're very similar in the sense that they are classrooms, they're classroom based, we're starting with a classroom. There's another way to do it. And that is to start from first principles and design a differentiated space right from the beginning. So here we've got, oops, sorry. Here we've got a variety of spaces. One of these could be used as a traditional classroom. There are garage doors and opening up between them here and here. We have a teacher area. The rooms are really quite a bit smaller than a classroom size. And there's more variations, seminar, seminar, move them together. Here's a new room here, which has got, this is for uh, grade six to eight. This has got the science facilities on the perimeter. It has art facilities. It has uh, small tools. And it's called a Da Vinci studio. And so that's to combine science and art, maybe industrial ed, robotics could happen in there. And it's called a Da Vinci studio because Surely that's what Leonardo had when he was doing his great work. That, that space, in reality, is, really hard, is really, being really hard uh, to, uh, to implement. Vancouver School Board has uh, currently two, one Lord Kitchener, one at McCorkadale, and then this one, which is under construction at UBC. And it'll be interesting to see how this, how this develops. Uh, what, these are harder to do, as I mentioned, because uh, there's no pat answer. 
We can't say, okay, we're gonna do classrooms on a corridor. That's easy, we've done that for 20 years or more. Uh, with this one, we've actually got to collaborate with educators. We have to figure out, not we, the group needs to figure out, the teachers need to figure out how is education going to be delivered? What is, what projects, what, are we going to use project-based learning? Are we going to have collaboration and what kind, what role are the students going to have? And so whenever, certainly whenever that happens, this discussion is enriched. You know, because architects don't just sit in the corner and suck their thumb and then, oh, let's try this 21st century stuff. Uh, we, we collaborate with our clients and we try to get it as best we can for the, hand, for the glove to fit the hand, but then sometimes the hand changes. And so none of these walls here should be load-bearing, so we can rip them out in 10 years if it doesn't work. And, that, and the ones that are classroom-based, it's sort of, okay, well, we're trying this, it didn't work, well, we can always retreat back to the classroom. But again, in those examples I gave, really our intent is to not have load-bearing walls so that we can rip it all out. I'd like to discuss other spaces. Uh, in the school, I toured High Tech High some years ago in San Diego, and here is the plan. Well, the first thing you'll notice, and I, I'm sorry it's out of focus, uh, first thing you'll notice is that there's no room labeled classroom, but if you look closely, there's also no room labeled library. And uh, when we uh, had this student tour, took us around, it was very interesting. Uh, one of the students said that, I think here I'm getting an education, I'm learning how to learn, I'm not learning how to pass an exam, I'm not going to get high, grade, high SAT scores, but I don't care, I'm going to have an education. And as we, you know, informally talked about, and these were very frank kids, they said, you know, we really could use a library. I said, oh, gosh, why would you need a library? And because they need a library so they can get away from it all, I guess, so they can do focus study, so they can get, check other resources and so forth. And I was at a conference in Washington last year, uh, and it's ironic that as the collections in libraries are going down, the attendance in U.S. libraries is going up. And so, and the presenter said the transformation in libraries is that the old former libraries were like a grocery store with stuff on the shelf, whereas the new libraries are like kitchens. There's stuff going on. So there's instructional things, there's people meeting people, there's seminars, there's lectures. People go there to meet other people to just find things and discuss stuff. I wonder, is that my alarm or? <laughs> so here's a drawing of the library at Centennial. We've got a very small area for the collection, a variety of spaces for individual study. We've got a presentation area for teachers, uh, for cl whole classrooms here, a projection wall. In an area here, which starts out life as a computer lab, uh, but likely will evolve into a place where one would prepare, edit, and view videos. Because that's becoming a really large part of uh, what's going on in schools, and a library is a good spot to do that. Libraries are also uh, useful for those students who do online learning or those who are, do self-directed learning. This is sort of their proxy uh, classroom, and they can meet their advisors there. They can collaborate with other, uh, with other students there. Uh, Sir John Oliver High School in uh, Vancouver, an old school, has transformed their library, which is a basement space, and I don't even think there's any windows in it, and it's the most exciting, popular space in the school. It, uh, it does not have, you know, those controller things. It doesn't have a checkout. Uh, you, and you can see that on YouTube. Uh, you walk in, and it's like Starbucks. There's soft furniture and tables. There's soft furniture in the fiction area. The collection is sort of in one little portion of the building. There's cube furniture they can move around, projection screens. And the kids are totally engaged, totally active. And you can see why this is an exciting space. I'd 
like to talk briefly about science. Uh, it's been my experience so far, and I haven't met all the science teachers around, but to get science teachers to collaborate with one another is difficult enough. To get them to collaborate with the rest of the teachers is, uh, is difficult because they want a department. And then even the biology department wants a department. And I, I don't know what that is. Uh, but what we, one of the things that's happening, and this has been going on for at least 10 years, is trying to create a super lab to combine chemistry and physics and optics uh, all in, uh, to use the same facility. Because science facilities are used likely, and this changes, about 25% of the time. So a lot of the spaces in schools are really single use. And to try to get more use out of these facilities, uh, they really have to become more multipurpose, multifunctional. But science uh, teachers are a resource. They're smart people. Uh, and if, if you can get them to participate in the learning community, uh, think how enriched that life in that community will be. Here back to you, Hill, and I mentioned before, we've got our four learning communities in this corner. These rooms here, these five rooms are all science, but they're connected to the learning community here. They also have a door on the outside and they have prep rooms between them. So they can kind of claim to be a department, but they're also part of the learning community. And there was great reluctance from the science teachers for this, but I talked to two of them and they're really quite happy with this arrangement. I uh, heard, and it, didn't, it wasn't at U-Hill, I heard about from a science teacher about a joint project that they had combining English composition and science. And the assignment was uh, to pretend that you are a, one of the elements on the periodic table. Your oxygen, your nitrogen, your uranium, sulfur. You know, and how would you react then with others? Would you be gregarious? Would you, be, would you blow up? Uh, are, you uh, 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 are you toxic? Uh, and then they, to conclude this, the idea would be to prepare a video, do a drama, give a lecture, write an essay. And the kicker here was don't write the essay and give it to the teacher. Write the essay and publish it on the school web, website so that the peers, your peers will be judging your essay. You know, that's way worse, I understand, than having teachers graded. <laughs> Students are social animals. And their life throughout the day, their mini crises, the mini dramas, their accomplishments, their fears, their hopes, the relationships they make, that's their life. Can you imagine if you're going into one classroom for 40 minutes, come out down the hallway, next classroom for 40 minutes, come out, go the hallway, oh, maybe a more interesting classroom over here. At the end, that's pretty damn boring. And, and if you ask any, any teenager, they'll say, Dad, I got no life. And so you have to think of this school as being a vessel for them to live their life. And so you need, we need to provide uh, opportunities for social interaction. It could be simple ones. Here we've got a bank of lockers, uh, seating. Uh, it kind of looks like this, the teacher area is right there. Lanker, lockers, seating. Uh, in plan, we've got that here. We've got a sink, a microwave and these little nodes, which are part of the learning communities. We call these watering holes. So that uh, the kids will have a reason to go there, to empty or fill their locker, to uh, have their lunch, and so forth. Stairs are natural sort of magnets for social interaction. We know that uh, from research and the way brains work, that our, our brains need complex and novel environments. And we also know that stress re impedes learning. So we need to design spaces that are interesting, that reduce stress, and accommodate a student's life. 
We know that good quality environments have a positive effect on learning. And we know that 21st century skills are learned by doing. And everyone has a preferred learning style. And lastly, schools are incubators for social interaction. And here's a last word from an architect. It's not about the building. Thank you.